to Knitting Class. Today we're going to talk about another kind of cast-on. We have previously talked about long tail cast-on, which I think is one of the most useful cast-ons. It has a very strong base and it's not going to easily distort. This cast-on that I'm going to teach today is probably the easiest. It's called the backwards thumb or the backwards loop cast-on. Perhaps you know how to do it. A lot of people learn this cast-on when they're first starting. The problems with it is that it's a very loose cast-on and the stitches can get really wiggly on your second row after your cast-on. I think it's useful in some lace cast-ons. Sometimes people will use it for a button cast-on. If you've cast off for a buttonhole and you're coming back on the second row to do a quick cast-on. So let's take a closer look at how this works. So for this cast on, for long tail cast on, you have to have a long tail in order to incorporate many stitches. For this cast on, that's not necessary. So make enough of a tail so that you can weave in your ends. I would recommend at least eight inches. And the whole idea with a backwards thumb loop is you put your thumb in and then you twist it backwards and put that on the needle. So the first thing, let's do the slip knot. I don't always do slip knots because they're not necessary, but it certainly does anchor your yarn and keep it from coming off, especially for a new application. So here's our slip knot. Now I take, knot the end with the tail, the end connected to the balls, put your thumb underneath it, and twist your thumb back. You've made a little loop. Coming from the back of the loop, put that on your needle. All it is is a twist. If you don't twist it, if you're wondering, okay, we're gonna do it again. Thumb underneath, bring it up, twist backwards, backwards loop, and put it on. Here's our slip knot is one stitch and our two stitches cast on. Put my thumb in, pick it up, twist the loop all the way backwards, and put it on. If you're wondering, oh dear, I don't remember, which way was I supposed to slip, twist my thumb? If you put it on incorrectly, if I take it and I twist my thumb, but I don't come through the backwards loop, if I just put it on like this, don't worry, you actually, it doesn't actually make a loop. So if you're doing it incorrectly, it won't make a loop. If you're doing it correctly, you'll get a loop on here and you can continue with your knitting. Let's do it again. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to knit this first row. I have five stitches I cast on and one that was with the slip knot. And I'm going to see if it will allow some extra yarn through. Like I said, that's kind of the negative aspect of this cast on. Every time you knit your first row, it's always very stiff from the cast on. So the first row is often the hardest to knit one stitch. With every stitch I make, it pulls and then when I take it off it tightens that final row. So now I'm starting to get a little bit of a long strand between my stitches. That is the nature of the backwards loop cast on. I don't think there's much you can do except make sure you don't tighten and pull your needles apart. Do you see the only thing between my stitches is one strand of yarn? And if I were to straighten out, then you might potentially get a big gap. And your last one will not snug up because of your slip knot. So you're left with a cast on row, yes. And yes, you've been able to knit into it, but you might have a little bit of a sloppy bottom that might not be anything you're concerned about at all for a scarf or mittens or a sweater. Again, it is the easiest cast on to do, but it also can be a little bit weak. It's definitely a good one to have in your arsenal. Go ahead and try it out. And for those of you crocheters out there, 
You can try this with a crochet hook. Try casting on with your thumb on the back of a crochet hook and see if you two can do that. I wonder if that would at all work in a Tunisian crochet applique. Please let me know, any Tunisian crocheters out there. Thanks for joining us in knitting class, and I'm glad that you could learn another cast on. Welcome to this segment of Let's Get It Started. We're going to talk about another basic stitch of crochet, half double crochet. Let's take a look at what we're crocheting on here. This is the sample we've previously worked on with single crochet and with double crochet. And we can tell the difference according to how short the rows are or if we have this little bit of a, a slit between them. This is our double crochet. A half double crochet is a little bit of both of them. So let's take a look. The first thing we do at the beginning of a row is we do some chains according to how tall our stitch is going to be. For a single crochet, we do one chain. For a double crochet, we do two chains. For a half double crochet, we will chain two. And again, this is just at the beginning of the row. And now we have the height that we need to go across. To do a half double crochet, yarn over your hook, insert your hook into both of the top of the stitch, and draw your loop through. Yarn over. Now if we were going to do a double crochet, we'd only bring it through two at a time. But the half double crochet, we yarn over and pull through all three of those posts on our hook. Let's do it again. Yarn over. Insert your hook into both of the top stitches. Yarn over again and draw through. We now have three loops on our hook. We yarn over and pull through all three. Now we'll do two and you can watch. There's half double crochet. Let's take a look at how it looks different. Here's our single crochet row, and here's a, a wrong side single crochet row. It's very short. We've got a couple legs, and we've got a bump in the center. When we look at our double crochet, you have the windings around that post. Our half double crochet has a little bit more height than the single, but we don't have that full slit and that full high post. It has its own uses. I have used it on a pattern of Irish crochet, which I'll show you in another segment. So there's how you do half double crochet. It's an important stitch to keep in your crochet arsenal, and it can be very handy in a proper application. Thanks for joining us, and let's get it started. Welcome to this segment of Mistakes and Mishaps. I wanted to share a mistake with you that I have encountered multiple times this week. I don't know if it's the yarn I'm using or what, but I thought, you know what, I bet other people maybe have encountered this too. This is a mistake of having a split stitch on your needle. Let's take a closer look here. Let's say I've been away from my knitting for a while and I pick it up and I look at it and I think, oh no, something's wrong. And perhaps you can tell because I've decided to knit with two strands together to make a bulky yarn. And you can see more clearly this one, this stitch has a blue and an orange. This stitch has a blue and an orange. This stitch, where is the blue? There's no blue. And so on, down the line. One of them, something is wrong with. Now it could be that you are knitting with a yarn that is all one color. And I'm going to pull this one up as an example. A little bit hard to see, but here is a yarn that is all one color, but it has what is called two plies. A ply, and when I have my spinning friends on, they'll be able to tell you more. If you take the yarn and you untwist it, this one has what are 
basically two pieces of yarn, two separately spun pieces of yarn that after they're made are spun together as well and it creates one yarn. This is called, each of these is called a ply and so this is a two plied yarn. It says two plies. Now the yarn that I was knitting with this week was a two plied yarn and as I was knitting I would look at the stitches on my needle just like this one and I didn't have the uh, luxury of having two colors but I could see wait a minute one of these strands looks very small compared with the rest of them on here. Well, What do you do to fix that? First of all depending on what you're knitting with it could be that the strand is very um, tough and it can endure and you can just go ahead and knit it. What I'm going to do right now to fix the mistake is I'm going to knit to the mistake and then fix it. So here's one stitch, two stitches, and I'm checking them. I've got both of my plies. I get to this one. Now I could just knit it and keep going and if I have really strong yarn um, it, will, it will manage. But what I usually do is I put my needle through and I find the ply that's been dropped. So let's flip it over. Here's a little bit of the blue bump. And using my knitting needles as tools that they are, before I knit into the stitch I'm going to pick up that other ply. There it is. I'm going to pick it up and I will join it with my stitch on the needle. So now I have a full yarn and I can knit it as normal. And that's a really good tool to have in your knitting bag. If you have a mistake, get your needles over to it. Try to figure out how it was supposed to look in the first place and see if you can repair that. Now a second, a second uh, side of the same problem is what if you are in the midst of making that problem? What do you do? So I am usually to knit. I come through the front left to the back right. Draw my yarn through. What if I, by mistake, I'm starting to knit. Can you see that? I have split the stitch. Instead of going through both of them with the tip of my needle since it's a little bit sharp, by mistake I split the stitch on my needle and I started to knit and when I pulled it through I'm not pulling it through both of those plies, both of those strands of yarn. I pulled it through the center when I pull it off. So that's how that mistake is usually made. When I pull it off, I still have a blue loop, but it's not secure. It's hanging out free and easy, and I've only got the orange. If that happens and you're watching it and you can say, what happened? Just go back to it, knit backwards, get to where both of those stitches are on your needle again, and then you can continue as before. So if you're halfway through, if you pull up, if you see a little half loop waving off at you, you knit backwards, and here's where I can interject a knitting story. How do you, what is knitting backwards? T-I-N-K. People will call knitting backwards tinking because you're spelling the knit stitch backwards. Tink back to where you made the mistake. and fix it. It's a lot better to do that than have an entire garment done and seeing a little loop at the end waving out at you. Hello! Thank you for joining us on another Mistakes and Mishaps. If you have mistakes and mishaps and you don't know how to overcome them, you're welcome to join us at the Knitting Group at the Library the second Thursday of every month from 10 to 11. Bring your knitting mistakes. Myself or someone else will have a look at them and crochet. We're happy to help out. Or you can always email us and I can address it here on the show. Thanks for watching. Someone who I have to be To say that it's overrated Crochet fashion thing of the past But just because it's called Hi. I wanted to address a couple questions that I've had online regarding my Sami mittens. Sami mittens have are all similar in that they have a utilitarian cuff this type of thumb that you use is called a peasant thumb and almost all of them have a braid and a tassel off of the cuff. The Swedish braids and tassels are off of the, um, the middle of the cuff 
and the Norwegian and the Finnish ones are off the edge of the cuff. This one has a braid, but not a tassel. Um, I have written in my patterns how to do the braids, but it's so three-dimensional, it's kind of hard to tell just by reading words or just by looking at a two-dimensional image. So I wanted to show you, using this platform, how to do a braid. First of all, all the braids involve four strands. You can get the four strands either by cutting four strands and weaving them into the edge of the mitten, or by cutting two doubled strands and then taking a yarn needle, feeding it through the place where you want it, and having it, the yarn come off on the edge doubled. We are going to assume that latter one. And I don't have, um, this is larger yarn than I usually use just as an example, so I'm not going to put it on a mitten. Instead, we will pretend that this crochet hook is the mitten, and if you look closer, we will use this as our workspace. I'm going to take two pieces of painter's tape. If this were a mitten, I could tape my mitten to a surface so it doesn't move. Here I'm doing it with the crochet hook. And now we have four strands coming off. Again, we are pretending like this is the cuff. Coming off the cuff, there are two ways that you can arrange the yarn. One is to have, if you're doing this with two colors, to have one color entirely on the left and the other color on the right. The second arrangement is to have them ABAB, both colors on both sides. We will do this twice. Here's our first example of color A is entirely on the left, color B is entirely on the right. The way that you braid, some of you might know how to do a braid with three strands. This braid with four strands will produce a rounded braid with a pattern. You take the outmost yarn, you pass it underneath both of the center stitches, and then you pass it over the nearest center stitch. When you're done with that, you again have both of the orange on the right and both of the blue on the left. Let's tighten that up and we'll do it again, this time from the other side. This is the braid. You come from the outside, you go underneath both of the center stitches, not rearranging them, and then you come back over the closest center stitch, center strand, excuse me. Again at the end, we have our two yellow orange strands on the right, two blue on the left. Tighten it up. Let's do it again. Let's start on the orange side. If you ever forget, which one am I starting with? I can't remember. You start with the one that is the highest up, so it's the orange. Underneath both center strands, over the closest center strand. Tighten it up. Now with the blue on the outside, underneath both center strands and over the closest center strand. Tighten it up. We start to see a little bit of a pattern. I'm going to do a few more crosses without speaking. You just watch. Can you begin to see a pattern? On this, I have straight rows coming down, a straight row of orange, a straight row of blue, a straight row of orange, and on the back side, a straight row of blue. So despite having all the orange on the right and all the orange, all the blue on the left, it's every other one on the braid. I have seen this demonstrated in lanyards, in nylon webbing rope as a type of braiding that's used for, um, I don't know, any kind of outdoor thing. But it's, it's really pretty 
and it's a nice decoration that can incorporate the strands that you've been using in your mitten. Okay, so this is the pattern we get with two orange on the right and two blue on the left. Let us try the other one. The movements that we do are going to be exactly the same. It just has to do with our initial setup and how we continue to keep the yarns after we start. Orange blue, orange blue. Let's try it. Let's take our outermost yarn, go underneath the two middle ones, and come back over the closest center one. Now again, we still have a blue and an orange and a blue and an orange, but they're swapping out where they are. Let's do the blue up and over. Now it's the outside blue's turn on the right side. Come under and over. under both, over the right, under both, over the center. We're also getting a striped pattern here, but can you see how it's different? Our stripes are no longer vertical, but they're kind of a little spiral stripe. Under both, up over one. I think it's amazing how just changing where one strand is you get such a different look. Vertical stripes with two on one side and two on the other and slightly spiraling stripes. Here you can see then when you look at this one, you know exactly, oh, okay, I, it's exactly like this one. I did one on one side and one on the other. And uh, I think my red and white striped, here's this one. This one, on the other hand, was done in this manner. So both of these are four-strand rounded braids. Both of these have the same applications. Both of them you can do at home. You can do a, on a mitten, or I'd be interested in hearing how someone else might want to use this braiding. And uh, they're both equally beautiful, but it's just fun to have two up your sleeve. Let me know if you have any other questions about knitting or crochet by emailing at intheloop at rtc1.com. Thanks for joining me. Yeah.